Today's scripture lesson is part of a triptych, which means there are three scenes. There was, um, the first scene of it is the uh, feeding of the 5,000. The second scene is Jesus walks on the water to the other side of the lake. Third scene, which we're reading the first part of it, the lectionary breaks it in two, is um, people discover Jesus is gone. <laughs> They go, well, where he goes? And so some people track him down and talk to him about bread. And it's probably a little different than what you would initially think. I mean, John's gospel is kind of convoluted at times, hard to kind of pick out the, the thread that goes through it. But um, they're looking for bread. Here are these words. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got in boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found them on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because of the signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. And they said to him, What must we do to perform these works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one whom he sent. And so they said to him, What sign are you going to give us so that we may see it and believe? Our ancestors ate manna from the wilderness, as it was written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is what which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. So you probably haven't noticed this, but we live in a very transactional society that, uh, that we have been conditioned from be probably before we were born because we live in a capitalistic culture that things have value and you exchange things of value to get what you want. So if you bought a car, you know that you're exchanging income that you have generated to have this physical presence in your driveway that you will use as a tool or, or use as a, as, a, as a status symbol. It can be all kinds of different things. And so when we do things in life, we weigh it out. We go, well, is it really worth it? I mean, I've had buyer's remorse. I've purchased things and got them home and, and used them for a while and going, man, I paid way too much for what I do with this. Or, oh, this didn't meet my expectation. Or ordered a meal where the food really wasn't what I thought I was going to get and had it and, and then paid the bill and just kind of left with the sour taste in my mouth because it really wasn't what I really wanted and the exchange wasn't good. Exchanging things is just what we do, you know, if... Money. We call, we call uh, pay day at our house transfer day because we, they transfer the money to us and we transfer the church, I should say, not they, the church transfers the money to us and then we transfer the money to all the other things that we do they, to, to run our lives. And so, so we're just a pass-through account of, the, of capitalism, I think. We don't seem to produce a lot of capital. I guess we do produce some capital because we people pay us. But for the most part, we are a transfer. We transfer money from one place to another place, and, and out of that comes some value. I guess you find some value in what we do, or you wouldn't pay us here. There's an interesting thing about this, this idea of transfer in goods, is that you have to remember that the Old Testament, the New Testament, all of the biblical time is before the dawn of capitalism. But people still transferred value on things. It was, that's as old, I think, as humans can go back, that at some point along the way, somebody had something that somebody else wanted, and an exchange was made. There was a value judged on what it is, and the exchange was made. So this passage today is about an exchange. 
So if we remember the last time we gathered here, we talked about the feeding of the 5,000. So these people who were fed by Jesus realized that the person who gave them food was gone. And they thought, we can do better than this if we track him down. We could probably figure out what is this is about. And if he's going to feed us, we're definitely going to be near him. Remember, this is a peasant class. This is a this is a group of people who didn't necessarily have all the food they wanted. And so they go to this event and there's more food than they've probably ever dreamed of having, enough that they all ate as much as they possibly wanted and there was food left over. And they saw that and they said, this is our meal ticket. And so they get in the boats, they go across the lake to the other side to Capernaum, which is kind of Jesus's anchor, or his locus, where he does his ministry. And, he, and they come up to him and they go, well, where did you go? We thought, we thought you were here to stay and then you left us. And Jesus responds to them, I think, in an interesting way. He goes, yeah, you're only here because you like the bread. You know, you didn't, you didn't see any of the value of what I was doing there. You just, you just saw the outcome and thought, wow, this is great. Let's just stay where the bread keeps coming. And then there's this discourse on what it is to follow God and what it is to, to receive from God something. They even say, oh, well, you know, Moses gave us bread too. And, and then Jesus goes, no, that really wasn't Moses. It was God who gave you bread. Moses was just the prophet, the intermediary who talked to you about serving God. It wasn't Moses' bread. It was God's bread. And if you really want to understand at all. It's all God's bread. It's what God grants to us. And in fact, in the next passage, which is part of the lectionary coming up, is, and whether the preachers decide to use it or not, is Jesus talks about himself as being the bread of life. But this exchange that is going on between these people who came because their, their hunger was satisfied and the idea that God can do it is an interesting dynamic that you still see working out in society, religious society, as well as in secular society, both. Many people call on God like Santa Claus. If you do this for me, God, then I will do this. You know, these exchanges happen all the time, and they happen at times when people are under extreme pressure, mostly. Yeah, a lot of people don't think about God hardly at all, you know. But when they're under extreme pressure, then it comes to mind, maybe I should ask God, maybe I should pray, maybe we can make a deal. And a lot of people end up being really hurt by that, I, I have to say. The deal that they thought they were going to make with God to save a marriage, keep a job, save a life, heal from an injury or from an illness, when it doesn't come together, well, that just means that God really, really doesn't care or that, or that there isn't a God or it's, you know, the list can be endless. The worst is the idea when religious figures tell other people that, well, your prayer wasn't open, it wasn't answered because you weren't faithful enough or you didn't do X or Y or Z or whatever it is that whatever the religious framework says that this person operates under, that that's why God didn't do it. Like, if you don't really measure up in God's eyes, that's why things don't go your way. And there's a whole industry, religious industry on that, you know, that, that uh, the prosperity gospel says that, you know, if you're living your life really well with God, well, God's going to just open the bank vaults and pour it on you, you know, and you'll be happy and you'll have money and you'll get all the things you ever want. It's like the Santa Claus deluxe version in which you're going to get it. But it doesn't really help people when they fall off the other end of that and they don't get it. They're left with a lot of regret. They're left with a lot of questions. Why didn't God listen to my prayer when they're listening to someone else's? And why is it that, and why is it that God becomes so arbitrary? So arbitrary that it seems to work for one person, but not for me. Does God not like me? Does God not exist? Are they just telling me lies about who and what God is in the world. Too often, we, in so many things in life, become tr so transactional 
that we can't see the value outside of a transaction. That, the, that it, has to, it has to have a value going into it to have something be legitimate or meaningful. In other words, if, if it has no value, then it, then it really doesn't exist. I remember, I remember I was doing some work for my mother and, the, and they were saying, and someone came by her house and said, oh, it's just great that you can come up here and do some work for your mom and she really appreciates it. And we're, you know, all the flowery stuff they say when you're digging in a yard. And I said, well, yes, my, my work here is priceless. In other words, it has no value, you know? It's not, we're not exchanging anything here. We're just digging a hole and fixing a sprinkler or whatever I was doing. <clears throat> and so, so we were, I was doing this because I care about my mother, for one, you know, and that's what you do. Why do you follow God if there's no exchange? Why even follow Jesus if there's no exchange? You know what, if we're not, if we are so exchange-oriented and we're so value-oriented in that, and we even talk about the values of faith, you know, what the value of faith is for people, but really there isn't any exchange being made. We can say that, oh, God loves the world so much that God just pours blessings upon us all the time, but it doesn't feel that way. It, you know, we all have to encounter in life things that go along that don't go seem our way or don't feel right to us or, or tragedy befalls us, and we don't, how do we, how do we gauge that if, if, if we're just doing it on the idea of the blessings are eternally ours? We're going to come up at some point along the way and think, well, that wasn't a blessing. In fact, I'm feeling pretty estranged about that right now. So if we are going to be serious about trying to have a relationship, I mean an active, ongoing relationship with a deity, or even it's even a little easier with Christ because we can imagine him in human form, where is the exchange? And how do we live in that exchange without having to Put a value on it, a price on it, or, or something else that says, well, this is worthwhile to me. Well, how is it worthwhile to you? People have a tough time describing the value of their faith. Oftentimes, they, they come down and they say, well, this is where it moved me in some kind of um, emotional or physical terms. This is what it opened up to me. Because, because we are so used to extracting value on things that happen or the way that we look at the world, that we have to develop it and say it in those kind of terms. But the reality of any kind of faith experience is the, transac the transitional, not transactional, but the transitional element of it. It moves you from one place to another. And there's the exchange is nothing more than you becoming aware of the reality around you and doing something with it. So it isn't so much that, that God comes out and, and puts the dollar down and you pick it up and you, and you move with it. It's more that these things are with us all the time, but we don't have our eyes open to it. We don't really see it around us unless we really are willing to look seriously at it and think that, is there something happening beyond my, the terms of my own living? Is there something happening that requires me to look at the world in a new way, to open myself up to it in a different way? Is there something happening that is transformational in me, so much so that I want to be trans transformational in the world? These encounters with Jesus in the crowd at this point are, are one in which there's Jesus is trying to shift them over and over and over again to thinking about the idea that God's abundance is theirs. That it, it's not about bread, it's not about transactions, it's not about anything other than God's presence and abundance is theirs, and it's really up to us to see it and to respond to it and to act about it in a way that's transformational first and foremost to us. And then out of that, it becomes an element of a Christian community or a Jewish community or an Islamic community, whatever it is, whatever that community is, and values put together, and out of that, they're empowered to do some transformational work as a group. But for us, 
it's really looking first at what God is doing around us that we might see. Jesus took a lot of time to explain to people the value of having your eyes open. And in fact, you know, it's, it's in the gospel stories, it's said all the time. If you have ears, hear. If you have eyes, see. In other words, it's all around you all the time. And it's really our task as followers of Christ in this place to have our eyes open to what God is doing in the world. It isn't about the transaction. It's not about what God is doing with us specifically. It's what God is doing in the world that we can participate in and be a part of. Prayers matter. Intention matters. All the things that we do to open our eyes and our lives to the world around us make a difference for us of people of faith. And it's really our task as followers of Christ is to do what he said, to keep our eyes and ears open to God's action in the world and be a transforming agent. Amen.